And so I just have been looking forward to the chance to talk to you about this because I wrote a book called Bunker Hill, uh, which is about the, star, the the revolution. And I, you know, I write books about groups of people getting into terrible situations. You know, whether they're on a whale ship eating each other or you know things like that. And I was attracted to the topic because I live on an island with a year-round population that was essentially what Boston's was. And I wanted to know what a community of that size experienced when under the pre enormous pressures of a revolution. And um, Stacy, you of course came to this from a different perspective. You, you know, you're a New Englander. Uh, you uh, wrote a previous two great books. Um, I first, uh, the first book of yours I read was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, which, as we all know, his mom came from Nantucket, and um, and then the witches, which is you know a fascinating look into that uh, dark side of our, our history. Did those books inform your ending up writing Sam Adams? Wow, you certainly set that up perfectly. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful sunny morning um, at this ungodly hour um, when I don't normally drink Diet Coke, but um, I am now, and, and I'm just, this is a mutual admiration society. I'm completely tickled to be here and in my native state and with the institution, Nathaniel Philbrick. So um, the book really did grow out of both of those books. I started it in, in 2016. Um, I don't know how the rest of you were feeling. I was having a nervous breakdown. Um, and I was really thinking about the words that we were all using that none of, all of us seem to be defining really differently suddenly. And what do we mean by a republic? What do we mean by a patriot? And, and so I had gone back to the Franklin book, in fact, to see, I, I actually thought I was gonna write a second book about Benjamin Franklin until my husband said, you can't write about the same person twice. And in the Franklin book is lurking Samuel Adams, whom I had written off, and as most people do, in kind of a sentence or two, as you know, the Massachusetts firebrand, more revolutionary than any other revolutionary. And I hadn't really thought about him otherwise. Um, and I went sort of into a deep dive into his correspondence and into the correspondences of his contemporaries where I discovered that every other 18th century patriot refers to him as the central player in the revolution or, the, or the, the patriarch of liberty. Last night we were talking about freedom. He's the apostle, apostle of liberty in Thomas Jefferson's definition, the most active, persevering, earliest man of the revolution. So that gave me pause. What did the founders know that we had forgotten? Um, and it probably helped that I had then, I had previously spent six very dark years in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692 and or it felt like 1692 to me, it was not exactly 1692 for the rest of the world. Um, and I was looking for someone, I mean, one of the great riddles of the witch trials, one of the riddles is what afflicted the girls, one of the riddles is why was the prosecution so robust, why did no one walk out of that courtroom innocent, and the third riddle is how did it end, who had the moral backbone to raise a hand and say something is deeply amiss here. And I was looking for that kind of figure. I was just looking for somebody who had that kind of a conscience and that, that, that strength of character. And Samuel Adams very much you know, corresponded to that figure for me. Yeah. So who was Sam Adams? Was he the uh, beer uh, drinking uh, person we see on those bottles? Um, was his greatness writ large in his youth? Um, who was he? So here's a hint for anyone thinking of writing a book. Don't ever write about a figure whose name has entered the popular lexicon for another reason. Because if you Google Samuel Adams, you will get the beer. And you can't research him at all without getting, you know, the first 170,000 hits are beer. Um, so that, the research for this book, as Anne suggested, was complicated, but that did not help. Um, I don't know why I find it so deeply appealing that Samuel Adams doesn't hit his stride until his 40s. He's an utter failure until midlife, really. Um, and I don't know why, but that, I find that just completely endearing. He um, goes to Harvard at 14, he gets an, a BA, he quickly earns an MA, and then he manages to squander a fortune, lose an inheritance, fail in an accounting firm, set up and close a shop, um, set up with friends and close a newspaper, and then becomes sort of known for his fluent pen and begins to be a political player right around the time of the Sugar and Stamp Acts in the 1764, 1765, when in fact he's writing, he writes the first response to the Stamp Act, which is sent to London 
on behalf of the Massachusetts House, even though he's not yet a member of the Massachusetts House. That job is entrusted to him because he's known to be so good with a, so, so artful on the page. But until that point, no, you can't see the promise or the, the backbone or the perseverance, the tenacity of the, of the future at all in those early years. Yeah, um, <laughs> one of the things I, I um, loved about your book is, uh, you know, you really made us, you know, this, he's a, this guy is kind of a Columbo, isn't he? I mean, he just sort of shuffles around and, and every, you know, and yet he's brilliant and has, has it all figured out. Now, was he a snappy dresser? No. Is that why you mentioned Columbo? Yes. Um, so, you know, every once in a while when you're writing a book, you read something early on and you just can't wait to get to that passage. I'm, I'm sure this has happened to you as well. You discover something and you don't even know how it's going to fit in, but you know it's going to go in the book somewhere and you can't wait to get there. And that happened with several things in this book, but one of the most delicious were these descriptions of Samuel Adams as he's about to head off to the First Continental Congress. And Boston clearly is unhappy with the fact that they are about to send this Columbo-like character who dresses so shabbily to Philadelphia to represent them on the national stage. And so one night at dinner, the, the family of Samuel Adams are interrupted by, in quick succession, a suit maker, a tailor, a shoemaker. And each of these men calls, it's like a fairy tale. Each of these men knocks at the door, calls, says, may I come in, may I take Mr. Adams's measure? Um, no, I won't say who sent me the benefactor for this is kept secret, although it's probably John Hancock. Um, and then a week later, magically appears on the Adams doorstep, this trunk of beautiful finery, the nicest wardrobe Samuel Adams has ever had, and in, which it, in, in that he sets out for Congress. So that tells you something about how he dressed. For the Second Continental Congress, he had been crouching in a swamp um, in Woburn um, and never made it back to Boston to get his clothes. So he arrives even worse dressed than he had, no had normally been. And then it's actually interesting. He, he doesn't know whether it's his very Adams-like he isn't certain whether he should really charge Congress or charge Massachusetts for the clothes that he buys to wear in Philadelphia. He, he just deliberates about this. Is that really a charge that the colony should bear on his behalf or should he be responsible for that charge? And he has no money. So it's a, it's a particularly pertinent question. Yeah, and uh, you know, everyone in the 18th century uh, w could ride a horse. George Washington, the greatest horseman of his age. What about Samuel Adams? You are the first reader to pick up on that. Amazing. So there seems to have been an early um, accident of some kind with a horse. And so Samuel Adams had, having been an urban creature all his life, avoided horses. However, as John points out to him, and John and Samuel Adams are second cousins. I should just step back for a second to say that John is about 13 years younger than Samuel and is recruited, as are many young men in Boston, by Samuel Adams um, to the opposition cause. And John looks up to his older cousin with starry eyes. In his mind, um, Samuel is a man of exquisite erudition and, and great humanity and terrific decorousness, not at all the, the firebrand we think of. And he's really starstruck by Samuel, but he's also annoyed at one point when they're on their way to Congress together that Samuel can't ride a horse because this is slowing them down. And so um, John gives Samuel, John and his servant give Samuel Adams riding lessons. And John, in typical John Adams fashion, um, is peeved thereafter because it seems that the servant thinks that Samuel is a better rider than was John. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Nothing like family rivalries, isn't it? Um, now, uh, you know, as a fellow writer, I, I'm always interested in how writers structure their books. And oh, wait, you structure your books? Yeah. <laughs> yes, and so do you, very craftily. And um, what I was very interested in that you begin with Paul Revere's ride. Now, why did you do that? I don't know about the rest of you, but um, it suddenly... Did anybody know where Paul Revere was going that night? I mean, it suddenly <laughs> dawned on me that we can all recite the poem. It's like, you know, locked in your head. You, you practically skip rope to it. But to the question, where exactly was Paul Revere riding, I had no answer. And suddenly it occurred to me that the whole point of writing this book, the whole point of thinking about Samuel Adams, 
is that he puts the revolution in a thoroughly different perspective. It's suddenly this nonlinear, rough and tumble, prolonged, somewhat violent, um, and really surprising 15 years, 14 years. And among the things that it puts cast in a different light is Paul Revere's ride. So you have this you know, archetypal moment in American history. Revere is actually riding off with instructions from Dr. Warren to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock that they are about to be arrested and deported to, to Great Britain for treason. And in fact, the, the order that we think that Revere executes that night is the order to destroy the munitions in Concord. And the reason that we, at least dimly, those of you who remember it think that, I didn't even remember that, is that those are actually his orders. He's ordered by General Gage to destroy the munitions, burn the tents, throw the powder kegs, upturn the powder kegs, throw the musket balls into the water. But what London had told Gage to order his men to do was to arrest John Hancock and Samuel Adams. And so there's a discrepancy there between the order as given from London and the order that Gage issues. And, and there are many theories as to why, or one can come up with many theories as to why we have that discrepancy. Probably Gage realized that at that moment to arrest Adams and Hancock, the two most wanted men in America, was to detonate a revolution, and he's reluctant to do so. Um, and he therefore gives an order that he thinks he can execute um, more legitimately. Or there was an oral order, and we just don't have any record of it. Certainly some of his officers that night searched for Hancock and Adams. So it, that search, which was so surprising to me, um, because it wasn't what I thought Paul Revere was galloping off to do, was I thought the moment to begin the book, first of all, because it's so ingrained in our minds, and secondly, because it so upsets the narrative. Also, you know, a guy galloping through the, through the dark, you know, that's always good drama. Yeah, <laughs> in fact, we, um, for my last book, Travels with George, we spent the night um, in that vicinity and were walking- But not in the swamp, I hope. Well, the next morning, we were walking Dora. She's met Dora and approves. Um, we were walking uh, in the parking lot, and we went, and there was the, the, the monument for the house that they fled, in, fled to with their, their salmon, right, to, to eat. Yeah, John, John Hancock's very obsessed with the salmon breakfast he's left behind, which follows from Lexington to Woburn, but which they never actually eat, so. Yeah, oh, yeah. well, it's all about the fish. Um, <laughs> Now, much of your book, particularly in the early part, hinges on an animosity uh, between Samuel Adams and Thomas Hutchinson. Uh, who is Thomas Hutchinson, and what about, you know, how does that sort of drive what will become a revolution? So Thomas Hutchinson is, like Samuel Adams, a, a fifth-generation son of Massachusetts. Um, Adams had gone to Harvard at 14, Thomas Hutchinson had gone at 11, um, Hutchinson's about a decade older. They have exactly the same education, and they've come down on very different sides of the question of crown control, because Thomas Hutchinson is a public servant. And by the time Adams has stopped shifting around and actually found a foothold, Thomas Hutchinson is in possession of a whole bouquet of titles. He's lieutenant governor, he's chief justice. He, titles tend to gravitate his way. And for reasons that probably had to do with the fact that um, there is just a general, animo general disaffection for an established elite, both John Adams and Samuel Adams have this aversion to Thomas Hutchinson and his bouquet of titles. And in fact, John will write about the fact that from the moment he and Samuel first meet, which oddly it seems not to have been until the 1760s, they agree that there is as he puts it, no greater threat to American liberties than Thomas Hutchinson. Not the crown, not parliament, Thomas Hutchinson. So there's this real, behind this revolutionary fervor, behind these sort of noble principles, there is this deep-seated personal aversion um, to Hutchinson and what he represents. And I think there's a lot of resonance with this today. I mean, there's a real sense that, that the elite is controlling colonial affairs, that the elite does not have the colony's best interests at heart. They have their own mercantile interests at heart. Um, it's unsurprising that, for example, when East India Tea first arrives in Boston, six men are appointed to sell it. Two of them are Thomas Hutchinson's sons, two of them are his close friends, and two of them are his relatives. And it's precisely that kind of one percenty thinking that the Adams men are so deeply opposed to. And so even during the Stamp Act riots, when Thomas Hutchinson's house is destroyed, Adams, neither Adams plays a role in that kind of violence, neither Adams approves of that violence, 
but nor really is there any deep sympathy for Thomas Hutchinson for what he's lost, which is, a, which is a fortune, essentially. Yeah, as anyone who has attended a Nantucket town meeting knows, <laughs> politics are often driven by personalities. <laughs> <clears throat> now, um, while, he, while Sam Adams despised Hutchinson, he revered one James Otis, who was born in Barnstable. Um, on the Cape. Talk about that relationship. I, I found that really fascinating. Yeah, I, I do too. Insofar as Adams has a mentor, um, it's really James Otis, who's um, just a, a, an utterly pyrotechnic orator, a brilliant logician, um, who argues that famously the writs of assistance case and loses his case, but in speaking about this idea that the Crown can seize anyone's property without a search warrant, um, crystallizes a lot of the free-floating ideas that Adams will spend essentially his career advertising in the press. But Otis has not just a, um, a spark of genius, he has some sort of mental illness, which obviously we, it's very hard for us to, to diagnose from this distance, but he increasingly over the next years, in, over the 1760s, destabilizes. And his, his mental health is further, deteriorates further after he's hit over the head in a barroom brawl when he challenges a customs official um, on a point of honor, essentially. So Samuel Adams is essentially at his side. Um, the two of them are in close contact. They're working hand in glove. But then by 1768, really, when troops first arrive in Boston, um, Thomas Hutchinson and his fellow Crown officers have stopped referring to Otis as the the restless incendiary, the great incendiary, um, the biggest problem in Boston, and Adams has become that person. And Otis has begun to take the back seat. And he will, and Adams will spend the next years really kind of cleaning up the messes behind Otis. Otis uh, one day might be a Whig and the next day might be a Tory. One day will shoot pistols outside his window. One day will go to see Thomas Hutchinson and apologize for all the trouble he's caused. I mean, he's clearly just very much unmoored over these years. And Adams will say to friends, you know, basically it's our job to take care of him and to, to see to his reputation um, while attempting to somehow fold him into a cause in which Otis doesn't entirely support, which Otis doesn't entirely support. Yeah, and, and I... It's very, it's very poignant, actually. It's yeah. poignant, and it's almost a metaphor for the psychic, you know, cost of a revolution. Um, you know, I know at one point John Adams has to sort of check out and, uh, you know, uh, go to a spa. Yeah. <laughs> and Thomas Hutchinson has a nervous breakdown right. as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, it's, you, you're, it's just real. These are really high-powered um, overachievers all going at each other. And, yeah. and I think that's one of the things that's so remarkable about, about, remarkable about Adams is the tenacity. I mean, everyone else, as right. you say, checks out for a certain point, goes into rehab, so, you know, in a way. And, and Adams is the only person who's still, you know, never, hand is never, never comes off the tiller. He's yeah, always he, at the ready. He was wired for this moment in history, wasn't he? In a, in, in, in a way that yeah. no one could have predicted, which right. is also interesting. But, you know, after, say, the Boston Massacre, where everyone else has essentially lost any motivation, everyone is exhausted by all of this resistance, all of this street protest. Thomas Hutchinson has very craftily bought off most everyone else in the opposition cause, yeah. and Hancock most of all. Adams is still out there relentlessly attacking people and, and sort of singing the, singing the anthems to the to, to the crowd, to the cause. Right, and one of the ways he does that, you know, it's the press. He's just a genius writer, and he creates how many pseudonyms? He, he creates a whole cast of characters, of narrative voices in, in the press, where you think it's all these people chiming in. It's just Samuel Adams. Yeah, it's just, which is really clever, right? It's like, yeah. you know, social media at its inception. Um, like, here's what you don't want, or here's what you sounds like you do want to do, but you don't want to do. You don't want to sit in the Massachusetts Historical Society for weeks on end reading every issue of the Boston Gazette published between 1764 and 1776. But one of us did, and, <laughs> and, and what you find is this extraordinary... Um, well, we have to talk about Harbottle Door, I suppose, oh, too. That was um, my next question. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, so what you find is this extraordinary outpouring of really, I mean, eloquent anthems to liberty and freedom and to American ideals and the idea of American sovereignty. People are really using the word Americans a lot at this point. 
Um, not all of those pieces are written by Samuel Adams, but um, 32 or so pseudonyms are ones we've been able to attach to him. And yes, it seems like there's this legion, this outpouring of unrest, this legion of um, opposition figures, all of whom are really Samuel Adams. There, it's interesting to see what happens with the pseudonyms because sometimes, sometimes Hutchinson and Francis Bernard, who had been the, the royal governor before Hutchinson, send pieces from the newspapers back to London um, as evidence of sedition and, say, and name these pieces as Adams's, and they're often not Adams's, but just the assumption was always if someone's going on nattering about this in the press, it's probably Samuel Adams. And, and there's a misidentification fairly often. On the other hand, John Adams will sometimes read a piece of his cousins and not recognize it. So there's, there's that tension back and forth. But many of the pseudonyms we owe um, we owe the discovery of many of the pseudonyms to a hardware store owner in his mid-30s named Harbottle Door, which right. is the- Can you say that name one yeah, more like time? It's like the best name yeah. for a cat, if anybody right. like has needs a name for a cat. Harbottle Door was this probably kind of obsessive compulsive hardware store owner who in his spare time, and he seems to have had a lot of spare time, um, bought every edition of the, of the Boston papers over these years and annotated them. And by annotate, I mean really annotated. Like he would exclaim against his, you know, he, oh, what a villain he would write about Thomas Hutchinson in the margins, or um, oh, this is my creed he would write next to a piece by Adams. And he very often for us identified who was behind the pseudonym. So that's one way we've been able to attach Adams to many of these pieces. And then Harbottledore writes this extraordinary kind of crazy quilt of an index to these papers. If, and if you can follow it, it really is kind of like a treasure hunt. You can sort of read back if you want to hear, you know, where did the Townsend Acts come up? You can follow Harbottle Door's crazy index back to them. But because of that annotating, we have something that I'm not sure I've, I've ever had as, as a resource, which is what the man in the street was actually thinking as he read a newspaper in these years, when of course nobody could see what was on the other side of 1776. And that, that's an, it's, a, it's a really thrilling um, set of documents because you really get a sense of what, what is going on in the, in the Bostonian mind. Yeah, so uh, tensions are mounting in Boston. Uh, the British bring in the troops uh, to Long Wharf. And Adams, uh, and so, you know, relationships between the townspeople and the troops are not great. Uh, and Adams creates a wonderful institution, um, sort of a, a news service uh, uh, in which he reports not only to Bostonians, but to the whole, all colonies about what's going on at Boston in this occupa military occupation. Was he entirely truthful? I think um, he's probably entirely untruthful, um, if, you were, if you want to really look at it closely. So he and a, several of his friends, and we know relatively little about how this came about, because like many things in Adams' life, it's secretive and subversive and behind the scenes, um, found a sort of news syndicate, roughly called the Journal of Occurrences, and they generated pieces weekly about the atrocities that are perpetuated on the, on the citizens of Boston by these rapacious troops. And you know, any number of old women who are at home alone reading the Bible are attacked by, Boston, by soldiers in Boston. Oddly enough, none of these incidents ever show up in the legal record, so that might be an indication of how truthful they are or aren't. But with each of, the, each of those pieces are dispatched from Boston to New York where they're reprinted, and then to Philadelphia where they're reprinted again, and only then do they make their way back to Boston, by which time nobody knows if these things ever really happened or not. So it's extremely effective in creating an enormous amount of sympathy for occupied Boston throughout the rest of the colonies. And Adams will, of course, bank on that sympathy later um, when troops return under much more, um, much more severe circumstances, but it really raises the flame, raises the temperatures up to the Boston Massacre. And throughout that year, as these pieces are circulating wildly, Thomas Hutchinson, poor Thomas Hutchinson, is tearing his hair out because he can see the effect that this is having. He can see that these are incredibly um, explosive pieces and that they are essentially making the, the town very, very, um, trigger happy with the soldiers, and he can see that, that a collision is imminent in some way or another. So he's basically just counting the minutes until something like the Boston Massacre is going to happen. Yeah, and uh, he, uh, Adams, I think his, from, from my perspective, uh, 
the invention of the Boston Committee of Correspondence is, is kind of related to that, where if you could talk briefly about how, because things calmed down after the massacre, and not, that's not what Adams wants, so he creates this committee. So, so one of, I think the probably greatest contribution of Adams, other than articulating both the, the, the vocabulary and the grammar on which, which the revolution will adopt, is that he, from an early stage, tries to unite the colonies. He's reaching out constantly to Rhode Islanders. Could you, could you take care of this for us? Could, to New Yorkers, could you join us in this effort? And the committees of correspondence are something that he ultimately succeeds with in 1772, having sort of thought about them a little bit and sort of sent trial balloons up earlier. And it's this, I think, purposefully vanilla name for what was actually an extraordinarily incendiary idea, which were basically committees in each town, ultimately in each province, ultimately in each colony, that would restate the rights of Americans and how those rights had been infringed by Great Britain. And those colonies begin to correspond with Boston. And you can it's an astonishing set of, of Letters, for example, after the Boston Tea Party. It's kind of like chat rooms. It's, these created. It's Twitter. Yeah. It's yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's it's a masterful coup, and and it's really what what's also sort of telling is you see Thomas Hutchinson's reaction to this after these are founded, and he thinks what a ludicrous idea. This thing will last for two seconds, and then of course then 60 towns are involved, and suddenly it's a less ludicrous idea, and then 120 towns are involved, and then comes back word from the king, could you please shut down those you know, troublesome committees of correspondence, and they're taken very seriously. But after the Boston Tea Party, you hear this outpouring in extremely similar language from almost every town and hamlet in New England about Boston's noble defense of liberties as opposed to Boston's lawless you know, destruction of property. And that is largely the result of those committees of correspondence. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the Boston Tea Party. And that's, well, it wasn't near and dear to Nantucketer's heart when it happened. But uh, we have, uh, you know, over Sylvia's Antiques at the, the, the Roach Counting House at the base of Main Street are um, emblazoned the names of the, the Nantucket whale ships, the Beaver and Dartmouth, that uh, got caught up in that Tea Party uh, by uh, taking their oil to London and then returning uh, with the, the, the hated tea. And remember, Nantucketers were loyalists, by and large. So um, could you talk about, they, the ships were owned by Joseph Roach, but it was his son Francis who got caught up in all of this. Poor Francis Roach, yeah. Francis Roach had to you know, walk into a meeting significantly larger than this one and explain why he couldn't return the detested tea. I mean, essentially to make a, to, to be, to reduce things to the most rudimentary form, the idea was for the tea to land was for American rights to be undermined. That tea had to go back to Great Britain without anyone unloading it, is the formula that essentially Adams and his friends have managed to craft. And poor Francis Roach is the one caught in the middle who can't legally um, lo turn, turn around without clearance from the port, and he can't get the clearance from the port until he pays the duty, and to pay the duty was essentially to um, go up against everything that Adams and his, and his friends believe. So Francis Roach is sent off, Francis Roach is 23, he's sent off in a, in a, on a drizzling, muddy night to go ask Thomas Hutchinson for special permission to return the tea. And Thomas Hutchinson, who has backed down once before, is very disinclined to do anything because, first of all, he doesn't think that anyone has it. He doesn't think it's likely that anyone's actually going to do anything. They're pretty much stuck. And secondly, he doesn't, he doesn't really feel like making a second concession. And so he sends Roach back to the town meeting in Boston without any solution to the problem. And it is shortly after Roach returns from that very muddy, very frantic ride that Samuel Adams will say nothing further can be done um, for the salvation of this country, and that seems to have been the premeditated signal. No one said that at the time um, for a certain portion of the meeting house to sort of disappear into the night and to um, arrive at the wharf, and then in a very carefully choreographed um, movement to hoist up those crates of tea and to slash them open and to dump the contents into the harbor. Thousands of Bostonians um, are on the wharf that night. Samuel Adams is very conspicuously not on the wharf. He and John Hancock and Dr. Warren and several others are still back in the meeting house um, where it was important that they be seen. Um, but of course, in an interesting Massachusetts twist, no one on the wharf that night, though, though there were some five or 6,000 Bostonians, no one had seen a thing. 
<laughs> well, I'm, we're getting uh, close to uh, turning it over to you uh, for some questions. I just have one last question I have to ask. Um, it's sort of a two-parter. Uh, would the revolution have happened without Sam Adams? And was the revolution a good thing? I think to the second question, it's too early to tell. Um, um, and, and, and yes, yes, of course. And, and you know, when I say there were 32 pseudonyms and all of those were Samuel Adams's, there were a lot of other people articulating these ideas. I think it's impossible to think you, that the revolution could have happened on the timetable it happened without someone like Adams having really got his arms around the entire idea without having been able to articulate what we consider today the anthems on, on which America is, you know, to which we sing our greatest odes, and without having insisted on this idea, and, and this was really central to his thinking, that without, um, without virtue, without a moral populace, you could not have a democracy, but, but that that was what America consisted of. And you know, really harping on these concepts in a way that you know, in 12 or 14 very short years, produces that revolution in thinking that produces the actual revolution in fighting. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, yes. There's a microphone coming your way. Thank you. Um, I've often thought that one of the <clears throat> unsung fathers of the American Revolution was a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell. Um, and I'm wondering if you, <clears throat> in your research, uh, encountered any evidence that that was on the minds of the American revolutionaries, the Commonwealth tradition. There's an enormous, um, I mean, a really impressive grasp of history on the minds of all of these men. Um, Interestingly, yes, they talk about Cromwell. They talk much more about Roman republics in these years. And you know, you see that both in their references, you see that in the cadence of their prose, and you see that in the pseudonyms to which they reach. They're really looking back mostly in terms of examples, in terms of ideals, to Rome. Yes. Two questions about women. Adam's wife, how supportive was she? How intelligent was she in being involved as, as uh, John Adam's wife was, as uh, Mercy Otis Warren? And the second question is about Mercy Otis Warren. Thank you. Um, th I'm so glad you sent us that way because somehow we never got there. So Adams marries um, two women, both of whom named Elizabeth. So this is going to be a little confusing. The, f the first one he, with, with the first one he has two children. Um, and she dies in childbirth. She dies after a stillborn birth. Um, which I guess is not in childbirth. She dies shortly after delivering their sixth child, um, of which only two survive. Um, seven years then go by, which is an eternity for a Boston man. I think Paul Revere goes seven months between wives. Um, and so Adams is a single parent for those seven years, raising his two children. And then he marries the, um, and that, the first wife had been the daughter of his family minister, whom he must have known all his life. The second wife is a daughter of a distiller who'd gone bankrupt in the, in the previous decades when, when things in Boston had become very dire economically, um, who's quite a bit younger than he, who is immensely well-educated, um, deeply resourceful, very much of the Abigail Adams variety, and Abigail Adams hardly approves of this marriage and, and kind of writes of it as a, um, she writes of it as a, as a affection between the two of them, which as she puts it is without affectation in any way, that they are just completely in sync one with the other. Um, there's a lot of correspondence with the second wife because Adams is in Philadelphia for nearly eight years. So unlike the first wife, you always want your subject and his, his or her loved one to be apart so you can read their correspondence. So we have almost nothing um, of the first wife, but of the second Betsy, we have a great deal. And possibly the most telling document is the letter she writes him, he's in Congress. Um, I should say that she's the only congressional wife who seems to have supported her family by manual labor while her husband was in Congress. I mean, she's really quite remarkable. But she writes him at one point and doesn't have a pen, because um, there are no pens left in the house, so she takes a pair of scissors and dips the scissor 
blade in the ink, and she writes him with that, apologizing all the while for her terrible handwriting, which of course is impeccable. Um, so she's you know, very much the kind of woman who writes and says, you know, there are, musk there, there, there are mortars exploding outside, but don't worry, we're fine. Um, you know, everything good here. And he, and he routinely, when he goes, comes back from Congress, like forgets to give her any spending money. And you know, six months later, she writes and says, oh, by the way, we, we've had no money for six months. So just like un, you know, undaunted, very much uh, shares his political passions. At one point, he's made fun of by um, some British writers because he talks politics with his wife. I mean, she's very much attuned to what he's doing. She shares his convictions, um, and she feels deeply invested in the, in the American cause. Oh, I'm sorry, Mercy Otis Warren. Um, Mercy Otis Warren and Adams were friendly. He's very flirtatious with her, which is a side of him you don't see with anyone else. Um, and at one point, John Adams challenges her to write a, a poem about the Boston Tea Party. It's a, it's a challenge that she, in fact, takes up. And she writes to John in a sort of elliptical letter, sort of saying, I'll write that poem when you tell me who the chief perpetrators were. And, and of course, John doesn't do that. Uh, right there, la this last question. Uh, in Valiant Ambition, you imply that uh, there's antipathy between the Adams and George Washington. Anything about that? Um, so the antipathy between George Washington and Samuel Adams is something that appears to have been the invention of John Hancock. And it was very useful. Um, John Han the, I, and I, we didn't talk about this. Adams recruits John Hancock, a younger man, um, as wealthy as Adams is impoverished, because Adams believes that Hancock's fortune will help the cause and that the attention that Hancock receives for his political role will make the very vain John Hancock very happy, as it does. But the two of them have very different sets of priorities. Adams, uh, Hancock is, as you know, a, a very flamboyant character. He's, there has never been a naming opportunity this man could pass up. He's extre an extremely generous benefactor to Boston. He's probably the person who supported Samuel Adams during all these years. But he really likes attention. He doesn't have all that much interest, it seems, in ideas. And Adams, of course, is of just the opposite school. Appearances mean nothing to him, ideas mean everything. And so the two of them are very close, um, very close associates, they fall out, they're close associates, they fall out, they crouch in a swamp together, they fall out. I mean, it's just this on and again, off again, odd couple kind of relationship. And there is a tremendous amount of ill will generated among the Massachusetts delegates in Congress, at the Second Continental Congress, where John Hancock seems to feel he's getting the short end of the stick and the Adams men are treating him like a second class player. And because of that, he goes back to Boston and pretty much poisons the waters against Samuel Adams. And one of, the, one of the stories that he tells is that Adams had been complicit in the Conway Cabal in which Adams had no role whatsoever. And Adams, in fact, in a very pathetic um, moment, will read that in the first history written. I mean, he, he lives long enough to read the first histories of what he's done. And he'll read this completely fictional account of his own complicity on the Conway Cabal in the, in the first history of the revolution. So it's, it's really kind of, that's a John Hancock fabrication, but as we know, myths often outlive the truth. Well, thank you very much, Stacey. This has been a delight. Thank you so much. Thank you.